you know, there's a difference between making photos and taking photos. Taking photos is, hey, look, there's this crowd of people. Let me, that's taking photos. Making photos is literally camping out, whether mentally or physically, looking for something that really, you know, will grab someone, something that will really make them think, or something that actually shows the true essence of what you're photographing. When you make a photo, you're not just making a picture, you're making a feeling, you're making an expression. You're capturing something that is happening right there in the moment that's very powerful. Welcome to Binder. I'm Ray McManus. Perhaps uh, the hardest thing in being an artist is really separating your own personal experience from the experience that you're trying to write or trying to recreate. I think when we write poetry, for instance, uh, we have opportunities to slide into personas, to mask ideas from objects or other voices. When in fact, they are our own voices that are sort of working their way through. But if we always did that, there would be something disingenuous that happens in the art. We're not really creating an art in as much as we're creating just another manifestation of ourselves. It's a very thing that I wrestle with as well. I think we all sort of do with art. At first, I was bothered by that because I felt like I was cheating a little bit in what I was creating that I was just telling a story of something that I experienced. But what ultimately I had to realize, and I think artists just reached this point, that in as much as we want to separate ourselves from the art that we're creating, it's almost impossible because it's who we are as artists. But when you think about someone like the photojournalist and the photographers that we've been talking to, they have to consciously separate those two things but there's always a moment where it's going to collide. Back when I was a kid, there was this store called Blockbuster. You know, some of the younger kids might not remember that store, but there was the system called Nintendo 64. Back then, the cool thing was Pokemon. There was this game called Pokemon Snap, where the whole idea was to take pictures of Pokemon in this video game. I really, really fell in love with that game. And so one day it just kind of hit me like, wait a minute, I can do this in real life. But then I started taking my allowance and getting disposable cameras. And with those disposable cameras, I really fell in love with photography altogether. My name is Crush Rush and I'm a 34 year old photojournalist slash photographer here in Columbia, South Carolina. I find my passion in really documenting the world and uh, doing my best to make it a better place. So even at an early age, you were already invested in trying to capture moments in life in, in film. What's beautiful about photography and really what's beautiful about your work in, in particular, I say your work as if it's isolated from the other photographers, because mm -hmm. really all, all of y'all in this particular exhibit, I consider, you know, really to have a, a level of mastery about what you're trying to capture. Y'all are able to grab a slice of humanity. You know, we're going to talk specifically. Or inhumanity. Or, yeah, I was going to say, right. we're going to talk specifically about, you know, how humanity interacts with inhumanity. Because, you know, this past year was a pretty volatile year. And for a lot of us, you know, we witnessed the, the things that were transpiring through the safety and confines of our living rooms, right? But when you look at this exhibit, you really get a... a a full narrative of a lot of different things that are going on. And even then, each piece is only taking a sliver of a narrative, right? right? We don't know what happens before. We don't know what happens after. We've talked a lot about the moment when you're in the middle of this protest and you're going around and you're trying to get as many images as you can. Are there things that you are intentionally looking for when you do that? No, so there's definitely, you know, something that you look for. Nowadays, with how volatile things are and how you see the acts of violence on, you know, photojournalists and journalists in general, the first thing you're looking for is danger. You know, whether that's safe danger, which means something that you might be okay with going into, 
are, you know, of course, danger, danger, which is something that you need to stay away from because you know that it can be very volatile and you have to protect yourself. You know, me and the other photojournalists, we're all friends. We all look out for each other. You know, when we're in the middle of like the craziness, we're always checking in with each other. Thankfully, I haven't had to do it for any of my fellow photojournalists, but I've definitely had to do it for people who are a part of it. I have first aid skills. So while I'm taking a photo, my humanity side is still in full toe because it can get bad very, very quickly. And I don't think people realize that like the human element and, and mob mentality is a whole thing. Mm -hmm. You can get 20 of the most peaceful, great people together. And one outside agitator can just just really facilitate something so deep and something so negative in our psyche that those 20 people are now aligned with that one person. And that's when things really, really go bad. And I think that's what we saw, you know, during the, the riot that we had. We can call it that, you know, mm -hmm. with the riot that we had in Colombia. We can we can say that things got bad because they were a handful of people who turned the great, powerful, peaceful majority into things that they were not. So you have to be really, really conscious about that because one person saying, hey, get that camera out here can lead to two people saying, hey, get that camera out here. And if you got two people saying it, it doesn't just add, it multiplies. Sure. You know, sure. it's not <laughs> two plus one plus two. No, it's two times two times four. And so you have to be really, really conscious about that. So many times I think people feel like they have no voice. Right. They, they, they are left, uh, you know, they're powerless. Mm -hmm. They have no voice to speak to power, to speak truth to power. And they rely on, on, you know, primitive to, motion. Right. Yeah. Right. To, to get that. So it doesn't take much to, mm -hmm. to spark that, you know, when, if you're, if you're already feeling that and now you've got not just the anger of what happened in that moment, mm -hmm. but that moment has been compounded of moments that have happened. That's correct. For years, right. you know? And so it takes one guy to take a skateboard and throw it through a That's window. It. And it's That's like, it. hell yeah, let's all throw our That's skateboards exactly. through the windows, you know? Right. And I think I really want our listeners to understand that, you know, your goal is not to be out there as an artist. You're doing right. a job. All these other things can come from mm -hmm. it. You could be giving voice to voiceless. You can be the artist. You can be out there. But you are doing a job. You right. are trying to present to the world what you are seeing through your camera. Right. So you and, don't have to be out there. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. And, and, and so it saddens me, angers me to a certain extent that the target in this becomes the photojournalist. I mean, we would not just have the image mm -hmm. itself, but we wouldn't have all the things that come around that image, the conversations, the things that, that we really need to be talking about now. Now that we have gone through one hell of a year right. um, and we are hopefully more people are getting vaccinated. Mm -hmm. um, who knows? I hope, I hope <laughs> we can see that trend continue working right. in the right direction. To where now we're out of our living rooms, mm -hmm. we're back together again. Right. Now's a great time to see these images so that we can start talking to each other again. Who are we now? Right. Where are we going now? What's our trajectory? Right. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I'll break it down really, really simple for you in regards to why people are the way that they are in regards to, you know, photography, videography, you know, journalists in general. I want you to think about social media. I want you to think about the photos that you upload. And then I want you to think about that random photo your cousin took of you and you look absolutely crazy. You don't look manicured. You look like, <laughs> they like, man, we need to check on him because he does not look like he's doing well. So the power of an image is that when people are looking their best, they want the cameras around. When people are doing something that they know they're not supposed to be doing, something that is questionable, they don't want the cameras around. So what happens is the protests, those same outside agitators, everybody wants to be seen. I'm fighting for justice. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do to make this world a better place. And then those outside agitators come in and they shift the narrative of those photos. Now people are at their worst. Now those hideous social media photos can come in from the, you know, I'm, I turn into the cousin that's trying to take candidates at the barbecue after you've already had four or five tall boys. You know, I'm the bad guy now. If you don't want me to right. capture this, then don't, don't do it. That's it. <laughs> right. That's it. 
would there ever be any attacks on photo journalists if people were always acting the way that they're supposed to? Because then we'd have a plethora yeah. of people, shining faces, shining stars. Satiety looks great. Everything's good. How do you decompress from stuff like that, man? I mean, you're in you're in the thick of a lot going on. I mean, yeah. there's 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 moments that are touching, and there's moments that are outright violent, and there's moments that are outright terrifying. So, believe it or not. I am probably the world's most introverted extrovert and the most extroverted introvert. I'm constantly, you know, struggling with that line of how I identify subconsciously. I mean, I know that when I decompress, I disappear. Mm. Like I check out. And and last year it was so rough because it was just nonstop and I couldn't afford to check out. And, you know, being a black man. You know, before I was ever a photojournalist, before I ever dabbled in anything, I was born in the skin and I experienced racism at a very young age, you know, moving to Lexington in fourth grade when things weren't as really integrated as they are now. There's a lot of trauma that I have based around race. You know, there's a lot of trauma that I have based around religion. You know, there's so many different things and race and religion have been in the spotlight for multiple reasons over the last couple of years. So last year was was really, really hard for me in particular because of what happened to George Floyd. You know, me covering so many of the protests and rallies, me being a lover of history and feeling like I was in those books in real time. Why do we have the same argument that we got today that Nat Turner had when he ran? Mm -hmm. It's the same thing over and over. Yeah. And we keep falling for this orchid dope. Make a Looking at all the old photos of the civil rights movements that was archived and then going through my photos and be like, damn, man, this is uh, this is 1962. You know, like these signs are almost identical. My brothers look like those brothers did back then. And so to keep it, like I said, non-biased, you got to really kind of keep those emotions and feelings at bay because once they come in the forefront, it does affect your work. And so I was doing really, really good. I was doing very, 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 very good until the Million Man March. We are marching for a reason. We're not marching for ourselves, but we're marching for our community, for those that are colored. Those... Something happened, something as they were marching in and I was on the stairs of the state house, I mean, I, I was just like thinking, I was like, man, I'm sweating, I'm sweating. And I realized that I was just crying. Like, that's how the dam broke. The emotional dam broke and I was crying. And then once, it's kind of like a cut when you're a kid, you hurt yourself and you don't feel it until you see the blood running down the next thing. You're like, oh my God, my leg, you know, like this hurts, I'm about to die, you know? And so I was like, man, Bro, you got to do something because now you're crying and don't even realize it. You know, you think about the slogan, they say, the more it changes, the more it stays the same. And then I was like, damn, I can really identify with that because, you know, civil rights and equality has changed so much, really, you know, since all the boycotts. It, but at the same time, it's still the same. Mm -hmm. It's still mm -hmm. the same. It's just it's quieter. It's almost like racism has become a subculture. But the subculture has infiltrated the main culture. So it's still here. Mm -hmm. And its ugly head is still very much calling the shots. It's still very much the systems. Mm -hmm. they, are, they very much still exist. They just have different names and different forms. It's just a bunch of doppelgangers. So then you get stuck. And you're like, man, I really thought things were different. Crush's work is part of Hindsight 2020 on view through October 24th. And you can check out his photo blog at www.crushinthecity.com. If you were as moved by that conversation as I was and want to hear more, check out our bonus episode wherever you get your podcasts. Coming up. I think it's important to have your soul straight first because, you know, you can't jump out there and write a poem about these intense issues if you haven't balanced it in your own mind. Lynn Lawson, after this short break. 
Hey y'all, producer Drew here to fill up your social calendar for September with some exciting CMA programming. On September 8th and the 14th, take a tour and get a new perspective on Amanda McCover's bright little day stars with volunteer coordinator and installation assistant, Jackie Palmieri. On September 22nd, grab a cocktail and a seat for a panel discussion featuring Carol Suvian, executive producer and director of the Peabody award-winning and Emmy-nominated PBS series, Craft in America. On September 25th, get your dancing shoes ready for Shea Alexander Presents Live on Boy Plaza with popular Charlotte-based outfit Reggie Graves and Jazz Theory. You can find out more about these and all of our upcoming programs and events on our website, www.columbiamuseum.org. And now, back to the show. Hypotenuse after Crush Rush. Figure one, Pythagorean theorem. A squared. A bullet won't make an angle unless it hits a target bolder than itself. B squared. My eyes must avoid this moment. I must try to look beyond it. They must obey the blinders of my shield. I must not believe the truth my eyes show me. C squared. The eyes of injustice strike deep as a bullet. The eyes of a revolutionary strike deeper through eternity. Caption. A black protester kneels, making eye contact with a black officer in riot gear who avoids the gaze, looking straight ahead into a void neglecting the hypotenuse of confrontation in the protester's eyes. The blackness of trigonometry in this moment cannot be denied. We know it better as trigonometry, in which the area between the eyes of injustice and the eyes of the revolutionary is equal to the sum of the areas of what separates the knee of the badge on a black man's neck to the knees of a mother wearing out her carpet for her baby to come home one more time. Pythagoras may have taught us best that an imaginary line is the sum of shorter ones. Line of sight is the sum of the areas of shorter distances. The ancestors would say, we get so close yet remain so far away. The sum of the areas in a revolutionary's line of sight penetrates through the shields, the human wall, their minds, the barriers of space and time. The shortest distance between two bodies is eye contact. Despite colonizing the triangle, Pythagoras knew we would need a formula to remember, to see the invisible line clearly. I'm Lynn Lawson. I'm an author of books of poetry, also a poet, of course, a professor and an editor of poetry anthologies. And I'm a lifelong South Carolina resident. Man, it is so good to be able to talk to you, Lynn. I always love being able to talk to you and, you know, your work probably moved me in more ways than, than I've ever really told you. But I've been able to learn so much about the African-American experience in America, in the South, primarily through poetry. At what point did you, once you became a poet, did you realize that, you know, as an African-American male, you know, you, you have a responsibility to get these words out to listeners so they can understand what it's like and what it's what what the world looks like through your eyes yeah well i also want to reciprocate and say it's always good to talk poetry with you or just talk in general (laughs) but uh it's always fun yeah so i honestly was one of those poets that was writing very young when i wasn't like outside playing during those old days and things like that 
I was just drawn to the pen or the pencil. And, you know, I even entered like contests when I was younger, like a middle school Arbor Day contest about trees. That was terrible, but, you know, something led me to do it. So just writing in general and, and also reading was the impetus for my writing a lot. I had tried to avoid it, I guess, and avoid my passions and avoid my purposes like education and poetry. So once I really broke down and said, okay, what am I really good at? And what am I really going to do the rest of my life that's going to make me happy? That's when I came back to the poetry. And so I would say within maybe the last uh, five or six years, it's gotten really intense with the culture that we live in, really impressing upon artists to make sense of the world that we're living in. And I think poetry is an awesome gateway to do that, to make difficult circumstances and situations seem simpler or seem, you know, understandable. My service as a poet is to do that, but not in a way that it's been already done, but, you know, to find my space in it and something that brings me a sense of comfort to all of these intense racial situations that are happening in our society. So, you know, I approach it as a black man and saying, well, you know, what's going to make me feel better and how can I make sense of this? And then, you know, if it does that for the audience, then, you know, that's a that's a bonus. Yeah. One of the things that I think has been sort of eye opening for a lot of our artists, writers and poets is the way we have had to try to process so much of the world around us. Often, you know, we kind of need to be in the world, you know, to be able to smell and hear and, and witness, you know, sure. fully to write about. But we weren't able to do that this past year. What was that experience like as, as, as a poet? How did you process a lot of that to try to write about it? I, I was making a joke on uh, social media that, you know, I claim to be an introvert, which may not come out a lot, you know, especially as a professor or something. But I was always saying, you know, introverts, this is our time. You know, this, we, <laughs> we were built for this. So, I, you know, I, when it comes down to staying at home, I got it down. It doesn't matter, you know, how long, but I was still, you know, keeping my ear to the ground about a lot of things and seeing how other people were processing everything. So that's part of my process is just observing is, you know, staying in tune and not just like being in a vacuum and like padded walls and, you know, nothing going on, but just sitting back and not speaking, but listening. So sometimes I have to, you know, take my time and say, well, again, what do I want to add to this? Or what can I, if anything, add to this? You do have this really cool ability where you're able to take a variety of different sources and, and incorporate them into, you know, you talk about, you know, making it your voice, you incorporate them into your voice. But you do that with a lot of your other work, too, with pop culture, superheroes. Still one of the pieces which I, I think is probably one of the most badass things I've ever heard a, a poet do at a time when we have seen so many names that have come across the news. People who have done rather innocent things or mm -hmm. not even doing anything at all um, and ended up dying and you took those names and sang those names to the tune of the Star Spangled Banner, yeah. um, which my, you know, hairs on my arms are still standing up. You know, it, I, w I will say, Lynn, it, it was completely intentional that I wanted you to be paired with Crush Rush because I saw some similarities in, yeah. in, in the aesthetic of, of what you write about and what he's trying to capture. How was that experience looking at Crush's work? Yeah, for sure. It's like you find yourself somewhere in the picture when, when I look at these things. And I just like the way that it's not just like the big picture or it's not like the big crowd, the group of people. He kind of lasers on these, you know, moments in time. If you blink, you'll miss them. And that's what I really saw especially with the poem that I just read, that awesome piece with the protester on his knees and looking up at the wall of police there. That was just amazing. That's poetry right there. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it was a real challenge to say, what could I possibly 
add, if anything, to this. You know, th- right. this is it. You know, yeah. you don't need to know anything. If you don't know anything else about race, about, you know, racism or police brutality or anything of the sort or George Floyd or any of the many names of people who have been killed by police, that says it all. I almost didn't want to do it because I was like, you know, <laughs> you know, what needs, what else needs to be said here? But I was thankfully able to find a way in. And with I think with ekphrastic poetry, that's kind of like what we want to do or what poets are kind of taught in practice maybe is to like, you know, find that peace in the portrait, the photograph, the painting that is not the big picture, but it's kind of like a, a director would zoom in on an image before the movie starts and then you pan out and see everything. So yeah, I just was looking at the eyes of the protester on his knees, looking straight up at the policeman there. And he was looking right in his eyes. Mm -hmm. But the policeman he's looking at, who is also black, he's looking straight ahead. And so I was thinking in terms of like geometry, I saw like a triangle from their line of sight the policeman's eyes going straight ahead. And then, you know, I just ran with it when I thought about that and the things that I said in the poem, hopefully bear that out. I like the way you phrase that because you're right with the phrases too often we think, oh, it's just put voice to whatever's there that doesn't have a voice. And and that does happen, but it doesn't happen that naturally. You have to find a way in yeah. um, and it may be a small sliver. It may be a small thing, but once you're in, then it's on. And that's what I think is, has been so cool about having poets working with the photographers and, you know, not try to speak for the image, but to amplify the voice. And even though as a, as a white man looking at that image, I can't see myself on my knees looking up at that officer, nor can I see what that officer is looking at. But what I can see is what you were describing in that poem. I mean, because that becomes something inside of me. I'm not, now I'm internalizing mm-hmm. that and I can see. And that I think is what is amazing that happens with a crisis, right? I always tell people there are many interpretations. You know, it's, it's not like the one interpretation or if I'm trying to teach it to, some, to a group or something like that, you know, it's, it's what you see. So whatever you see, that's, that's the narrative in it. And so it's, it doesn't have to be right or wrong. It's, it's just what it is. It's just like when you look in the mirror and basically art is supposed to be that mirror, you know, to hold up the mirror and say, okay, well, what do you, what do you see in yourself in this piece? And if you can see something that connects you, then we got them. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully that's what I'm, I'm looking for is like, if, if you can connect to this in any way, I got gotcha. you. Lynn is an editor of a book coming out this November titled The Future of Black, Afrofuturism, Black Comics, and Superhero Poetry. You can pre-order and check out all his published works on his website, lynnlawson.co. You know, I think for a long time, you know, being born and growing up in the South as a white heteronormative male, but one who has always seen himself as as an ally. One of the things that I think didn't really occur to me until probably towards the end of the 20th century and, and kind of going into 21st century is how often we feel like we are giving voice to those who, who don't have that voice, when in fact, what we really need to be doing is shutting up, stepping back, letting them speak and listening to what they have to say is, is how we really grow as a community. It's how we move forward and actually progress as a nation that is comprised of many races and many cultures. And it's one of the most beautiful things about this country. But unfortunately, this country's story has always been told from one perspective. Now we get to hear from multiple perspectives. And I'm fascinated by that because I learn so much. It's amazing how much we can learn if we can just be quiet and listen. You've been listening to Binder, a production of Columbia Museum of Art. Today's episode was hosted by me, Ray McManus. 
Produced and edited by Drew Barron, with special assistance from Joel Ryan Cook. For more information about Binder, CMA exhibitions, and programs, please visit our website at www.columbiamuseum.org. 